It's okay. Welcome everybody to Digital Hub. I'm Marco Livotto and today's seminar is a half an hour um, overview on a very powerful color space called LAB or Lab as it is known to friends yeah? as a color laboratory. Yeah? Um, let me tell you first what we are going to talk about. Yesterday we had two brief seminars about color management and the principles uh, which allow us, and you of course, to achieve constant color throughout the processing workflow. And today we focus more on image preparation, which is slightly different. You know, I'll tell you my philosophy. There is a well-known school of thought now that uh, digital images are very fragile and should be treated with respect. And uh, you shouldn't hit them because they will get hopelessly ruined. And I'm going to show you this is absolutely not true in general. Digital images have more information than you could ever imagine in their own minds because <laughs> I, I think of their numbers as mind in a way. They know about themselves. And I'll try to show you a few techniques. Uh, most of this uh, session will be interactive if I can manage to do it on my on the very small space. Okay? So, um, as I told you, my name is Marco Livotto. Um, as I was trained as a physicist, actually. But for some weird reason, I ended up working in the field of uh, image color correction. And I was a student with Dan Margulis, who is actually the man who invented, uh, or at least coded, color correction uh, in the last 20 years. He made, uh, sort of built the bridge between the old analog world and how it should be done today in the digital world, which is not easy at all. My job is that, um, well, I produce images, of course, but as well, I am a teacher, a writer, and a consultant. And uh, if you ever speak Italian on that website, www.teacherinthebox.it, there are about 40 hours of uh, the um, training and courses that I've done on video. All right. So let me tell you first why I called this session Unleashing the Power of LAB. LAB is also known as uh, C Lab or C1976 L star, A star, B star for your pleasure, is a very peculiar color space. It is very different from uh, RGB and CMYK in that it completely separates lightness from color. And this has a very, very deep uh, reason because uh, our, it, it's a bit difficult to explain but recent studies, and even not so recent, actually show that we don't see with our eyes, but we see with our brain. The eyes, you should think of the eyes as lenses, but the real processing happens in the brain. And uh, to make it very easy, what happens is that we have uh, sensors like the eyes that work in RGB, but then the signal, because a signal it is, it's an electric signal going down and back to here in the cortex uh, is encoded differently in three components uh, which really separate lightness and we'll see how on one side and color on two other components. So LAB is closer to our viewing system than any other um, color space. Okay, when I say lightness, you should think of it as a, some sort of grayscale image. You can make hundreds, millions of different, slightly different grayscale image from one color image, but it's one of these. I, I don't care how it is really encoded at the moment, but remember it only has luminosity and no color at all. Yet, if I am talking about pure color, this is more difficult to visualize. So, I will start from an example. This is the example I'm going to use. You see a very colorful picture that I'm going to open in Photoshop right now. And uh, just like many of the pictures that you are used to work on, this is RGB. So there are three channels that we call the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. And actually, they drive the pixels on your monitor, better said, the sub-pixel, the red, green, and blue component. And so this is how it works, RGB. It's rather easy to understand. Now, let me do this. I'll do image, mode, and switch to LAB color, 
And I suggest you keep an eye on the rightmost palette where the channels are visualized and see what happens. Everything changes. We still have three components, and this is lightness, as I said. So you see, it is really a black and white or grayscale, or how you want to call it, image. And then we have two very weird components called A and B. The L in LAB stands for lightness. The A and B stand for absolutely nothing. They have no meaning. They are simply called like that. If I put all these components together, I get the original image. But I would like to show you what I mean by lightness alone, but most important, color alone. This is the color of the image without any variation of lightness. As, as soon as, I, as lightness goes back, you see everything takes shape again. But what you see here is a sort of uh, completely lacking contrast and having no change in luminosity at all. This is a bit difficult to grasp, I realize. So, let me tell you a story. You know that John Lennon was killed in 1980. I'm going to explain why he wasn't killed with the other Beatles while he was going through Abbey Road, because this is a very important picture. You've seen it many times before. This is uh, absolutely easy uh, with this picture to understand how LAB works, because you see, starting from the front, you have John Lennon, then Ringo Starr, and then Paul McCartney, and George Harrison is last. And John is dressed in white. And Ringo is dressed in, I would say, black, and Paul in gray. And they are walking on a basically neutral background hmm, with almost no variation. The reason why they weren't hit by a car is that, you know, there are some illnesses in the eye, like Daltonism, which prevent you from seeing colors. And there is also a very, very, very range, uh, very rare uh, illness called achromatopsy that gives you black and white vision. But there is absolutely no illness which removes luminosity and keeps color. Because suppose there was one, and suppose that someone was driving on Abbey Road on that day, what he would see was this. The black, the white, the gray, of whatever shade, are completely gray in LAB. There is no variation in luminosity. So if there ever was an illness like this, we wouldn't have the famous album Abbey Road. And that's how John Lennon managed to survive, basically. But he was unlucky enough to be hit and killed by a madman in 1980. All right? So let me try to explain now what happens with the channels, what, what their meaning is. We'll simply forget about the L, because that's the easy part. It's a grayscale image modulating luminosity, basically, and it's called lightness. Lightness is just one of the many forms of luminosity, like brightness, like radiance, like there are different physical quantities. We don't care. But the A and B channels, all together, manage to produce all the colors that we can imagine. So we have the A component that is called the green magenta channel. And you can see it here with a white arrow indicating the two different directions. Because one of the features of LAB, or LAB as you call it, is that its color channels are made from opponent colors. That is, green is the opponent color of magenta. And they are paired together. Hmm? Exactly like the B takes care of the blue-yellow component. In the middle, when a color is neither green nor magenta, neither blue nor yellow, that is right in this place, you have neutrality. Okay. LAB is a very, very strange color space because it's the only color space we have in Photoshop that allows channels to take up negative numbers. And when you have A negative, minus than zero, the color is biased towards green. And when you have A greater than zero, it goes towards magenta. For B, negative B indicates blue, and a positive B indicates yellow. 
If this is difficult to grasp, let me give you an example, and I will use a very simple tool that is a coin. Maybe you can see it because we are not close enough, but this is a very simple model of a lab channel. Because a coin has two sides, so imagine this is the A channel, for instance, and imagine this, painted green, and this painted magenta, okay? They are opponents because you cannot see them together. Uh, if I flip the coin like this, some of you will see magenta, some others will see green, but no one of you will be able to see green and magenta together. The closest you can get is by looking at the edge of the coin, which means that the color is neither green nor magenta. And that's called neutrality in the A channel, all right? So when I say that my skin isn't biased towards green, I am actually saying in a very short form that my skin is more magenta than it is green and that lady's shirt is more green than it is magenta because they all go together. This is the idea. So negative A and you get the green and then flip the arrow, positive A and you get the magenta negative B, and you get the blues, positive Bs, and you get the yellows. How about the other colors? They are built by synthesis, you see. When you have both A and B positive, so you're in the middle of the magenta and the yellow axis, you get red. And when you have green and yellow together, that's called lime, it's more like uh, greenery vegetable green. Then you get cyan by, uh, sorry, there is a mistake, I'm afraid. It's A minus, minor than zero, and B minor than zero, it goes cyan. And then finally you get violet this way. There are some features of LAB which are interesting. First, it has a huge gamut. Anyone who was here yesterday knows what game it is. It's the footprint. It's how big the palette we have. And some of the LAB colors are so vivid, so bright, so intense that they are impossible for us to see. For instance, there is no way in any color space that you use regularly, like any form of RGB, that you can represent the colors of a firework. But you can in, in LAB. You can't put them on a monitor, you can print it, but in, as a line of principle, it is possible. Also, it's very interesting that LAB is the only color space in Photoshop that has an absolute meaning because there are no variations, no variants of LAB. That is, you may have many different RGBs, many different CMYKs, but only one LAB. And this means, of course, that there is no profile attached to it because you don't need it. It is a very good space because it's so huge as a connection space in conversion between color spaces. Whenever you go to CMYK, you're actually diving into LAB and coming out of LAB. RGB calls for LAB to compute the colors and then converts to CMYK. Finally, it is more perceptually uniform than any other color space in RGB. It's closer to what we see. It can isolate colors as no other space can, as we'll see. And also, it has the incredible power of enhancing color micro variations. There are some techniques that you can achieve in lab, and I'm going to show you in a second, that you can do in any other color space. Finally, it is like an elephant in a glass store, like it can ruin your images in seconds because it is so powerful. Remember that when you're working with a powerful tool, then with power comes responsibility. So you must be very aware of what you're doing with LAB, otherwise you can really crash your images in uh, uh, the blink of an eye, really. And I would like to show you some examples to show what LAB can actually do and I'll start from one of the most famous pictures of my courses. That's the bridesmaids. Anyone can guess where this wedding was taking place? Huh? Look at the color of the shirts, of the, sorry, of the skirts. England, I think. Yeah? I'm not sure about many things in life, but one I'm sure about those skirts are 
magenta. They are one of the most magenta things that I've ever seen. Hmm? They're not reproduced so well in the projection, but believe me, it was blindingly magenta. Now, for a second, suppose this is a fashion shooting or whatever, and that you need to publish this in a magazine. And the art director comes and tells you, well, it's fine, but I want those skirts to be navy blue, exactly as they are. So you, th you would think that this involves a lot of uh, subtle retouching. Well, let me show you. If I move to LAB, the only thing I actually need to do is to look at the channels and realize that while lightness is not of any help to isolate the skirts, and the B channel is not of any help, as we expect, the A channel has the skirts absolutely uh, isolated from the rest, they are lighter. And why? Because I told you that the A channel is responsible for the green magenta component. And what we have here is that anything not being very much green or magenta in the middle is represented by 50% gray. Anything going towards the magenta is lighter and anyone going to the green is darker. Look at the grass at the bottom, and look how darker the channel is here than here. The more magenta you have, the lighter the channel it becomes. But if you've ever seen a layer mask, you realize that this is a prototypic layer mask that works perfectly. What I'm going to do, did I say navy blue, something like this, okay? I'm just going to create a colored layer that covers the image completely. It hasn't disappeared. It's only beyond here. And I'm going to move this to color, which means use the color of the current layer and the luminosity from what's below, all right? But I could do it like this, invert the layer mask, grab a brush, of reasonable size and start brushing. The only problem, oh, made a mistake. I'm not that much of a painter, I tell you. But the image knows better than me because what I can do is, on the mask, apply the A channel from this. Click on the mask make a curve and bring the mask to this state and as you see the skirts are completely isolated this is a, an almost perfect mask because all I need to do here is to make a simple very simple selection fill it with black, and there you go. It's finished. How did I do it? I just extracted the magenta information from the A channel, and I have a bonus here that I can change to any color I like. No problem. And if I want to be even more precise, I could fire up a curves adjustment layer substitute the layer mask I've, uh, I've done already, get rid of the color fill, and I can manipulate the luminosity and the color of the skirts as much as I want. No problem. Okay. Um, you can do this in any other color space than LAB. When you have an outstanding color that claims for its place, this is what you're going to do. Go to LAB and it will be hidden somewhere. You can make a mask, you can change it, you can do anything you want. Now, probably you find this very difficult, but let me show you one thing. This is a nice picture, but it has a big problem. Maybe you don't realize it's that big, but you will realize in a second. There was a yellow wall on the side of the baby, so this half of the picture, the, the, the left half for, for you, is very, very yellow. Let me show it to you. Just grab an eyedropper, go window info, and 
Well, we moved to LAB just for the sake of, uh, okay, that doesn't ruin the picture at all. Um, please look at the numbers here and we'll try to understand what they mean. I read 81, 11, 20. So do you remember what A was? Was a magenta component and B was the yellow component. I say magenta and yellow because they are both positive in this case. All right. Um, this is, I'm not going into this today, but LAB is very useful to assess color and see if we have correct color. For skin tone, this is a perfectly uh, valuable formula. It simply means that we have, uh, uh, the boy has in this case, a very light skin, 81 as lightness when the maximum is 100, and the color is uh, uh, on the red side, more biased towards the yellow than the magenta, which is what we are used to. Huh? We are not pink, really, as we say. Hmm? And, um, okay, the problem is when we move to here, the numbers change, and we have 63, 16, and 42. This is far too yellow, and you realize that the numbers tell you why they, you have a problem there. Now, what are we going to do? The expert color corrector doesn't stop in front of the numbers and goes like this. We have a problem in the B channel because it's the yellow cast that we want to remove. Okay, let me show you first why I told you that LAB can be very dangerous. Let me grab a curve and play with it. Oops. Oh, God. And I haven't gone that far, really. All right. It's a huge, huge color space. Small movements can ruin the color completely. But nothing will happen if I stick a point in the middle of a curve and force it to be perfectly zero. Because that simply states neutrality will remain neutrality. Now, I grab this little hand here. And as I explore the image, you see a tiny circle moving on the curve depending on the color that I am reading. Now, this color is correct. Look at the circle on the curve. As I go here, it goes a lot further. And I don't want that, it's too yellow. So, stick a point here so that the curve remains steady. Now, are we going to correct this image like this? It's not that difficult. We just removed a yellow component. It would be extremely difficult to make a mask here. How do you select that half the face? Also, because let me show you, I go all the way down, the cast was everywhere. I've turned it into blue. This is what LAB can do. The boy is not going to be happy, but I mean, this is what the cast was. So how would you select that? You need a painter, you need someone who is very able to do it to make a mask like that and correct with standard techniques. But as you've seen, I haven't made any selection at all. And now, as I switch between the original image and the current version, you realize how bad this cast was. All right? LAB. Um, I hope that I, I'm the last, so if I go two minutes later, I don't think you'll care, all right? You want to see the last two images or just one? You decide. Two, you want, the lady says two, and he wants his three, all right. Okay, this is a sorry story. This is a rather sorry story, I must say, because the photographer actually asked me to take care of this picture. This is a friend of the photographer with a daughter, and unfortunately, she is ill. Her skin will be like that forever. There's no way to cure it. So she took pictures of her friend and the daughter. And this woman said, uh, listen, please, could you take care of my skin a bit? And the photographer said, yes, of course. And then she went to her studio and realized that there was not one single inch of skin that could be cloned. The only thing we could do here, and it would take hours, would be to rebuild the skin by cloning the girl which is ridiculous because a 42, 43 year old woman can't look like a girl who is seven years old. Okay, so she said, what can I do? 
Now, the scope of this thing is not to make the woman normal, it's to make this thing bearable. It is rather different. So, let me do it like this. I'll go curves. Um, before doing that, sorry, I need a starting point, which I, I, I'm not really sure it's the right one, but I have to start somewhere. So what I'll do is put a sampler here and a color sampler here and compare them. 67, 24, 25. This is a good formula for skin tone, believe me. And we have 63, 35, 16. Two magenta, two little yellow, and we see that. But we need these numbers as a reference. Now, let me go like this. These are, this is the curves. And what I'm going to do, difficult without the mouse, but I'm going to do the worst selection you've ever, ever seen, okay, of the face of the woman, because I want to isolate the face from the rest, okay? Now, I will go select, invert, so that the outside is selected. And since I am working on the mask, which is targeted, as you see, I simply go and fill the mask with black so that everything I do moves here. Basically, now deselect. The mask I've done prevents the other parts of the picture, although, you see, it's a very, very bad selection, I realize. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. Hmm. There is something that went wrong down here. Anyway, I don't care. Um, what I'm going to do now is use again from the background layer the A channel and I'll show you how. Because the A channel, when I work with a curve, is able to isolate completely the illness of the lady, unfortunately. So we have a mask that I don't think can ever be made in any other color method that really, to the extent we want, isolates the illness and the excess of magenta. And now I'm bringing back my info panel and try to match, as a starting point, the numbers of sample number two, which is down here, to the ones of sample number one. That is, make the colors more compatible. So, uh, properties, please, thanks. Luminosity of 60 should go into 67, I think. See the other side, all right. 35 is far too high, should go to around 25, as it is suggested by the others. And then I need a bit more yellow. And this is it. This is a starting point. You can start cloning here. Otherwise, you wouldn't. So this is very important to know your channels when you are working with images, right? I'm going to show you the last one now, which is to me the final proof that there is a myth, really, about not hitting images too much. Can you tell me what this is? Difficult to say, but it's a frog. The true question is how the photographer ever managed to see it. I mean, if this had been what our eyes would see, the frog would be doomed. Well, sorry, because he was going through the river. And this is what happens when you point a high-end reflex uh, camera to a frog who is sleeping in mud. You can't see the animal, all right? The question. OK, I'm joking, but just to an extent, really, um, this is very serious because the question is, how much does this image contain? How much information can we gather from it? Let me tell you, I am going to work on the assumption that this tiny feather floating on the water is white. I have no other way to assess color. I don't know which kind of mud I was looking at. So simply by, going, by working in RGB, I'll do a very, very standard maneuver and bring down, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Bring down the red a bit, like this. I'm reading these numbers. I want to make them equal, basically. And bring up the blue a bit 
so that such point is white. Okay. And by white, I mean neutral. Now, the picture is even less color than it used to be. Let's just go color. Use another curves layer and try to make some contrast out of it and see if we can see the frog. She's probably living in this part of the curve. So all this is very standard and I'll just use the luminosity because I don't want all that yellow to come out. So you can finally see there is a frog, all right? Now somebody could say to me, okay, nice work boy, but this looks like a black and white picture. So we could try to saturate it a bit. Do you agree it has more color than before? Like, this is the original, this is where I get, it's a bit more colored, but I don't like that. I like something that LAB can do, and I'm not even going to LAB. I'm going to use an action, which is not a plugin, it's based on something that Photoshop can do natively. And this action, actually it's a script, was made by me and some other people in Italy with the supervision of my teacher, Dan Margulis. Now be patient because it will take something like 35 minutes to run. It's very difficult, but I only need to hit. And as it runs, I will tell you uh, about my life. When I was a child, oh, it's finished. So where, did, where, where does this come from? We have a green. We have a green frog. We have a red autumn leaf. The feather has remained white. And everything, all this was in the original image, which is, if you allow, a simple JPEG. There's no raw file. There's not something that the camera recorded and that needed to be developed. And let me tell you, it's very important to see where we started from. Let me give it a bit of sharpening unsharp mask so that it pops out a bit more. This is where I got. It's a bit better on my screen, but it's a huge improvement. Let me see where we started from, revert. This was it. You didn't see me paint, you didn't see me select anything. Yes, I made the selection. The selection I made, the rough one, was, okay, this is the area where I want the colors enhanced. And all this happens with LAB if you want to use it. So, these are, were all the examples, and if you want to know more about these techniques and others, I will be doing a session about color correction for digital textile printing, and not only, tomorrow at 11 a.m., but not here in the Fabric Hub. Should have been today, I'm told. I'm sorry for if anyone went there to see me. It was a mistake. And this is the, uh, the web address of my blog, if you care. The, this is the one in English and there's one in Italian as well. So if you want to know more, come see, leave some comments, ask questions, I'll try to reply. Thank you very much for your attention. See you tomorrow.